In the Office of Readings, this morning we had for our second reading, our patristic reading from the Fathers, an excerpt from St. Irenaeus against heresies. And he was speaking of the, the life and unity of the Holy Trinity, focusing specifically on the, the sort of area where Jesus says, no one knows the Father except through the Son, and no one knows the Son except that the Father wills it. That these two have sort of a mutual sense of revelation of themselves to others, that we can't know the Father unless he reveals himself to us through his word. God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Jesus the Christ is the incarnation of the mirror image of the eternal, unperceivable Father. So in order for us to know the Father, in order for us to know God, he has to reveal himself to us through his word. Now, he's done that in the fullest way in the incarnation of Jesus. There is no greater, there's nothing more and no other way that God can reveal, the Father can reveal himself to us except through Jesus. That was how the Father willed to reveal the word, right? And then the word then, being the revealer of the Father, knowing that it was in the Father's heart, in the Father's will, that we know who he is, comes into the world to reveal the Father. This is how that, how that um, relationship works, where Jesus says, no one knows the Father except the Son, and no one knows the Son except that the Father wills it. Right? So Christ has come into the world, and this is what he says, for this purpose I have come. Let us go to the nearby villages that I may preach there also. God sent his Son into the world, yes, of course, to be our sacrifice, to be the expiation of our sins, to pay the debt of Adam. This is where we find ourselves in Hebrew right here. Since the children share in blood and flesh, Jesus likewise shared in them that through death he might destroy the one who has the power over death, that is the devil, and free those who through fear of death have been subject to slavery all their life. So Jesus came to be our sacrifice, to pay the debt of human sin, the fall of Adam, But he also came to reveal the Father. This is the the two-part expression of the heart, the mind and the heart of God. When we talk about knowing and loving, we can't love what we don't know. And so God, who wants us to love him, needs us to first know him. And then in order for us to love him, he first loves us through the act of charity, which is his sacrifice. So when Jesus says, this is why I have come, he means I have come to reveal the Father so that you may know who the Father is and what is his will. And then I have come that you might love him. And I give you the ability to love him by loving you first. And I love you by dying for you, paying your debt, so that when you die, you don't have to fear that death because you will living in me, rise again from the dead. All it is is the Mass. The whole Christian life is summed up in the action of the Mass. That the Word is made, uh, the Word is proclaimed, so that we can know the Father. And then God loves us in the sacrifice of the Eucharist, so that we can love Him by offering the same to Him. The gift he gives us is the gift he wishes to, be, to receive in return. There's no other way to live out the Christian life, to image, to mirror the activity of, of Jesus, or to experience the ministry of Jesus 2,023 years ago, give or take however many years, than to be here present at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. A, a, a microcosm of the whole Christian experience, a microcosm of, of God's whole work in the world. From the beginning of creation, we experience here. See, I make all things new. We experience it here. The proclamation of the word in the shadowy and fragmented ways of the Old Testament, we hear it here. 
and the proclamation of Jesus, the Word Himself made flesh through the articulation of the Gospel and the life of the church living just after, empowered by the Holy Spirit, we hear in the New Testament. The preaching and articulation of these things, the summation and and synthesis of them, we hear in sacred preaching, and then on solemnities at any, at any rate, we have the opportunity to stand up and profess the knowledge that we have of the Father. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, etc., etc., etc. And then having been confirmed in the knowledge of who God is. Y'all, think about that. We can say we know who God is. We can know something about God, a positive statement. This invisible, inaccessible light, we can say we have seen it. Not in its full glory, not in its full splendor. That's yet to still be revealed as of now we see as in a mirror darkly. But we see nevertheless. because Not because we're so smart. But because in our, in our smallness, He has come and revealed Himself to us the way that we need Him to reveal Himself to us so that we can know Him. And so that we can know the Father. But knowledge is utterly unsatisfying, especially when you finally come to know something you've desperately longed to know. If it ended there, it would be like an itch you could never scratch, or an appetite that you could never satiate. Once you know something or know someone whom you've longed to know, the only thing that will satisfy that second movement is love. And so Jesus, showing us the way to love the Father, takes on flesh like we have so that he can show us the way to love the Father. And the way to love the Father is to die in him and be restored to life in him. See, we have to pay the debt we owe the Father. Unfortunately, the only way we do that is by the shedding of our own blood. And if we do that, well, then we're dead. So how does God solve the problem of humanity needing to pay with its very life but still have life left afterward? He weds himself to our humanity so that when our humanity is destroyed, bound as it is to the divinity of God, it can never truly die. But restored to life as, in G- as with Jesus on the third day, we rise again with him. This action of reciprocal love, this action of rejuvenating life, it happens here in the Most Holy Eucharist. Jesus, who at the Last Supper, Jesus, who at the cross, Jesus, who rising from the tomb, gives us the ability to love the Father by paying the debt of our own lives, our own deaths, united to His divinity so that we don't need to fear that death. Because united to his divinity, we will rise. Death has no more power over us. Where, O death, is your sting? Where is your victory? Our victory is in Christ Jesus. How 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 can millions and millions and millions of Christians or people who say that they're Christians live a Christian life without being at the Mass? How? Ignorance is all. The word's not been proclaimed. A failure of love is all. Not perhaps through their own fault, but because they have no access to it. Who has the knowledge of God? Who has had the word preached to them? Who does have access to the love, the reciprocal love of death and resurrection? We have that. And the only one that can be blamed for there still being Protestants in the world is us. Some of you are 70 years old, 70 years of blame, 50 years of blame, 40 years of blame, 38 years of blame in my case. That we have not loved well the way Jesus has loved. We have not preached well the way Jesus has preached. We have not had the courage and the boldness and the disinterest of what others think of us to go into the world and say to the person that we just happened to randomly bump into, Do you know God and how much he loves you? I was talking to somebody the other day who really struggles with depression. And all I wanted them to know 
was that they aren't their depression. That who they are is really good and God made them that way. And that depression is just a sickness, an illness that they have to deal with. That who they are as a good person has to deal with. And that's their cross and that's their victory. That was hard to say to somebody who's, bear, bo- who's, who's, who's bearing the weight of that dark, wet blanket of depression. If half of what I said is true about the Mass, we should be sick to our stomachs to think that there are Christians out there, or those who desire to be Christians, who have no idea. But we do. Do we love them enough to do something about it? There's a a joke one of my seminary professors who was a Dominican used to say, he said, uh, you know, the Dominican order was founded to defeat the heresy of the Albigensians. The Jesuit order was founded to fe- defeat the heresy of the Protestant Reformation. Have you ever met an Albigensian? The idea being we still struggle with this separation between our brothers in the Protestant Revolution. When I say that we've been failing for 70 years, Joe, of course, laughed because I didn't start high enough for him. So, um, or, or 50 years or 40 years. What I, don't, what I don't mean is that it's our sole responsibility. All we can do is what we can do. The question we have to ask ourselves is simply, have I done everything that I can do? Right? Our job is not to, to, to change the world or to save the world. It's to do our part. Right? It's to sweep our front porch and then to go and help our neighbors. So as long as we're sweeping our front porch and we are going and helping our neighbors, those who want this but don't have it, then we don't have to, we don't have to feel burdened by um, the fact that there are still those out there who are not in full communion with the church. We just, it just, we, we just, we have to have that sense of responsibility for our brothers. I am my brother's keeper, and I know a brother who wants to be a Christian, and I know how to do that well. I'll go and help him. That's the sense of responsibility that we have to have as Christians. That's the spirit that drives us to evangelize the world, as Christ himself said, this was the reason why I came.